and welcome to Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Liu Xin. Today, I'll dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my panelists to compensate for the missing pieces of the puzzle. And for this week's topic, the coronavirus or COVID-19. By Friday, there have been over 82,000 confirmed cases globally, among them over 78,000 in China. The epidemic has caused over 2,700 deaths in China and 57 in other parts of the world. On the positive side, 36,000 people have been cured and released from hospitals. China has taken rigorous and unprecedented measures to fight this disease. The hardest hit city of Wuhan has converted 30 venues into temporary hospitals, offering an additional 30,000 beds. More than 40,000 medical workers from around China have arrived in Wuhan to work alongside their local counterparts. China is also producing over one million special purpose facial masks on a daily basis now, almost five times more than the level a month earlier. For infected patients, the medical costs had been minimized. Apart from existing national health care reimbursements, the government has promised to cover up to 60% of the rest for the confirmed patients. By February the 19th, China has earmarked 2.5 billion U.S. dollars worth of medical treatment. The central government has also scrutinized local governance in dealing with the epidemic. Hundreds of investigations, warnings and firings of officials have taken place, including the removal of high-level officials in the provincial capital of Wuhan. In Huanggang City, not far from Wuhan, for example, more than 300 officials were punished for their poor handling of the situation. How are the international press covering the COVID-19? This is probably the most infamous piece by now, published by the Wall Street Journal on February the 3rd. Much, much has been said about this headline, which has triggered a diplomatic row between the two countries. It's really a pity. The title is representative of one type of stories I've seen since the epidemic broke out, racist laden. According to the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, adopted by the United Nations, the Article 4 says that states, parties condemn all propaganda and all organizations which are based on ideas or theories of superiority of one race or group of persons of one color or ethnic origin or which attempt to justify or promote racial hatred and discrimination in any form. Clearly, the Wall Street Journal title is one such example. Now, some people have pointed out that the sick man metaphor has been used multiple times to refer to different countries, not just China. Therefore, it shouldn't be interpreted as targeting Chinese people or Asians. I would say it's time to stop using this kind of sweeping categorization because it insults entire groups of people. Nobody in this world has the right to condescend from some kind of self-proclaimed high ground. Such attitude is toxic to international relations. As the world is faced with a potential pandemic, we need empathy, not insults. Here comes the second type of reports, which I've read so far on the topic. They are reasonably fair, but let me explain. The epidemic has been described by the Chinese government as the biggest epidemic since the founding of the country 70 years ago and rightfully a test of China's political system. Multiple issues have emerged pointing to loopholes in the system and have been captured extensively by media at home and abroad. And here is my second sample today on transparency. The Financial Times published this on the 25th of February titled Sharp Fall in Coronavirus Cases undermined by questionable data. Obviously, the article questions the accuracy of data released by Chinese authorities, quoting experts who say such data are mired in politics. Now, the article refers to the sharp increase of confirmed cases in the hardest hit Hubei province since February the 13th and the sudden decline a week later. It's accurate 
that the sudden spike was because of the addition of so-called clinically diagnosed cases on top of the lab-confirmed cases, which needs a lab test. As lab test capacity caught up, such numbers were excluded again, resulting in the sudden drop. Now, in large part, the article does a fair job explaining the situation. It quotes experts who question the politics behind such swings, but also quotes a World Health Organization official saying the decline that we see is real. What I do find perplexing, however, is a tendency of agenda setting, consciously or not, such as in the subheading, experts say decline in new inspections is likely, but official count also mired in politics. This suggests that the official count has been manipulated. And the first sentence of the article goes, as President Xi vows to restart China's economy, a market slowdown in reported new coronavirus cases is helping his cause. Does the author imply that the sudden drop in number was tempered to suit the Chinese president's political needs? This is quite a serious claim. The sharp rise and decline has been explained by the article itself and no evidence is given to suggest any political consideration. Further down in the article, the reporter writes, as the overall trend points towards a decline, there remain concerns about potential underreporting outside Hubei. Again, don't look for evidence because you won't find any. According to the article, there might be underestimates because of the difficulty to track migrant workers or simply the long incubation period of the virus. The article cited two anonymous hospital staff in southern China who said they are seeing more cases than reported but gave no details. It then shifts the attention to Iran to talk about the underreporting problem there. Underreporting versus underestimates. The former implies active human intervention, whereas the latter could be just unavoidable because of the nature of the virus and the complexity of the reality. Could this article itself be mired in politics? Let's move on to my third sample story today and on to a positive note. Despite the bad and the suspicious, there are also media reports which are smart. This article was published on the 25th of February by CTV News from Canada. The article laid out the potential risk that Canada faces currently, that the virus could spread far and wide. And here is what I mean by being smart. The writer carefully looks into the lessons and experiences China went through to see what could be useful for Canada. For instance, nearly 4% of the medical workers in China have been infected, so enhanced protection for staff is critical, said one expert. This has been a dear lesson. On my show, I actually talked to a doctor in Wuhan who was in charge of treating infected medical staff. And the ambassador of an African country in China asked me for that clip so he could send it home to raise awareness of the risks. The article goes on to talk extensively about a fact-finding tour of a World Health Organization team of experts. It highlights that the team leader, Dr. Bruce Aylward, makes of China's efforts. Hundreds of thousands of people in China did not get the virus because of this aggressive response. Such recognition, I believe, is critical as it can help other countries save lives. The article also sets out to boost confidence and minimize public panic by quoting from Dr. Aylward that it is possible to affect the cause of COVID-19 outbreaks, but it takes a very aggressive and tough program. And the article listed some concrete measures adopted by China. In summing up, the article quotes the team leader, at this moment, the world needs the experience of China and access the expertise in China. They are keen to help. So in all, a fair and smart story, as now it is time to cooperate instead of finger pointing. So you have been watching Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Lucian. We'll take a very quick break and uh, we'll have a panel discussion on all of these topics I discussed. Stay with us. Welcome back. Joining me for the discussion today from New Delhi is Professor Daya K. Tutsu, 
Professor of International Communication of uh, Hong Kong Baptist University and from Shanghai, Professor Chen Hong, Executive Director of the Asia Pacific Studies Center at East China Normal University. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Uh, so we talked about uh, three stories. One is uh, one that has caused a big diplomatic problem between China and the United States. And then the second one is very critical and also suspecting the transparency of Chinese data released to the public on the number of infected cases and and the last one, which I believe was quite fair and positive, was uh, a Canadian report trying to draw on the China experience and China lesson. Let me go to Professor Tusu there. Um, I don't want to waste time on this um, you know, racism issue because I think it is very clear what is wrong, what is right. But in terms of transparency, I, I think it is very important because um, for days there have been many Chinese provinces and regions which have reported zero new added confirmed infections. I think it is very difficult for any authority to hide, to say there are zero new cases in, a, in an age of we media where everybody have access to the, on, to the internet. If anybody find, this, find a one new case, for instance, it would prove the government lying very quickly. So, I don't th so how, you know, how accuracy do you see the number in this day and age? Well, it's difficult, as you say, for governments to hide data. Um, and there are various sources of data which are not government-based. There are international organizations which provide data. Uh, there are NGOs. There are civil society groups. And there are just people, you know, ordinary people who would see cases in their vicinity, in their local neighborhoods, and might put it on the social media. Um, but I think I have a broader concern about this idea that something which comes from non-Western world somehow is not to be, you know, credible. Um, if you remember, there's been a lot of stuff written in respectable Western newspapers and other media about how the Chinese government message, massages, you know, figures about currency and about its GDP, about all that. The reality is that China is the you know, largest economy in terms of purchasing power par parity and in terms of total GDP is the second largest in the world. So it couldn't have achieved that by just massaging figures. That's just not a reasonable you know, uh, outcome of any serious discussion. So I think there is a bigger problem about credibility which is uh, more of a perception than the reality on the ground. Hmm. When you say that, when you say it's a, it's a problem of reception, do you also say China is suffering from a long-term mistrust or prejudice against the Chinese system, yeah. against the Chinese government? As a result, whatever you put out there, people simply don't believe you. Professor Tosu. Yes. And it's not just China, by the way. It's also other countries, too. And, you know, it's just the suggestion is the credible data comes from certain parts of the world and not other parts. That mm. is the problem, not just China. Mm -hmm. China happens to be, a, because of its, its, its you know, power and its uh, uh, you know, experience of being involved in so many other countries, it has become more of an issue. But otherwise, you could have the same argument about Brazil, about Russia, about India, about Egypt, etc. Mm, Professor Cheng, let me ask you the, the question about China, for instance. Um, it is true the Chinese government, central government, local government have been wanting to restart their production after the prolonged Spring Festival holiday, which is a very important thing, not just for China, but also for the world's economy because of the complex intertwined supply chain. The world is all, you know, bound together. So there is this pressing need, but do you think there is evi any evidence or any um, rationale for the Chinese government to possibly to massage these numbers in order to make people believe that they can go back to work? Well, first I think actually the uh, Chinese economy and also the, the world economy has been suffering, you know, a lot due to the standstill uh, uh, for the past over two months, you know, of uh, the uh, Chinese economy, which is actually the second largest economy in the world, the dynamo, you know, the engine of, uh, of world economy. So I think actually there is an urgent need, a necessity, an imperative mm -hmm. to uh, restart the uh, economy. But on the other hand, of course, you know, uh, everything must be based upon the true situation of uh, 
the status quo of the disease control. I think actually it is uh, always, you know, a kind of like a prejudice in the West, you know, to cast some kind of suspicion about the Chinese uh, authorities to be manipulating, you know, hard evidence. But actually, hard evidence cannot be ga gambled upon. You cannot gamble on statistics because statistics are hard evidence. So if you uh, you know, sort of like manipulating the uh, statistics and then try to actually to, uh, uh, you, know, you know, restart the uh, economy, it's self-deception. You know, ultimately, things will turn out to be, you know, disastrous. So I don't think actually the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, statistics or data is being manipulated, deliberately manipulated or, you know, you know, to be tampered with. I think actually, the, you know, the, uh, all the decisions is to actually ultimately be made by the government, by the authorities, uh, is based upon uh, the uh, the hard, hard statistics and also the current situation of the disease control. Mm, because at the end of the day, we're not talking about another country, another people. We're talking our own country, our own people. If there are infections spiraling out there and people are asked to go back to work, the Chinese yes. people will suffer potential losses and nobody can hide that. So I think, I think there's a huge risk there. On the other hand, some people would say, you That's know, right. okay, you talk about transparency, but at the beginning of the outbreak, there were people who were warning other people, doctors, for instance, who were warning other people about potential danger, and the Chinese government did not allow these information to, to spread on the internet. Doctor, uh, Professor Tusu, how do you look at the balance? I, I think there's a balance between transparency, but also uh, legitimate procedure and lawful dissemination of information. Whatever the situation, you do have uh, some kind of a channel sure. and who is legalized, who is authorized to release such important information. Yes. I think it's, it was unfortunate that that uh, very brave young doctor who um, tried to warn his peers that there is a problem and as n has now been admitted even by authorities in China that there should have been action taken earlier than they did take action. But also one has to remember this is a new uh, virus. People didn't know the implications of it and the speed with which it will spread. But I have to also say that China has been actually, if you look at the overall picture, has managed to contain it in one province. And that is a remarkable achievement in a country where 1.3 billion people live. Um, and I, I think the worry now is that, you know, this spreading all over the world. Uh, the latest uh, today, the new, latest worrying news for me is that Nigeria has had the first case. Um, and many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, elsewhere, the infrastructure isn't robust enough to deal with um, potential dangers and I suppose they have to look to China for what they have achieved so uh, in, in terms of containing it I, it's not over yet as we all know but they have made very um, serious and I think generally effective uh, you know steps to make sure that it doesn't spread beyond um, the, the epicenter of, of the Mm. In terms of the media reports, as I was, as I was highlighting in my thir third sample from this uh, Canadian TV, and I think they did a good job, not and I was recommending this piece not because yeah. they are praising China, but because they are smart to look into the Chinese numbers, because, as I said, uh, you know, yes. a, a large number of uh, ho uh, doctors and nurses were infected, which means there are things which can be done in preparation of any possible outbreak and I think that's the role of the international media which is to get information yes. from one part of the world and spread it to the, to the other part of the world so that people understand the situation better and can help, help themselves in dealing yes. with that situation. Um, Professor Chen, how do you look at the need, yes. I would say, for more informative uh, international coverage of uh, stories around the world, setting aside whatever differences that might divide us? Well, well, I think actually, you know, this uh, uh, epidemic is now becoming a global, you know, emergency health emergency, which actually needs coordination and cooperation among, you know, you know, different countries. So uh, media outlets, 
at different countries need to coordinate and collaborate, that is very important. So the share of information, share of technology, those are all actually the uh, prerequisites to ensure the ultimate victory over the, uh, uh, the crisis. I think actually uh, for now actually apart from uh, uh, being cautious about uh, as we were discussing about, uh, you know, the procedural, uh, you know, you know, channels of uh, reporting and also the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the data harvesting. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, actually, we also need to be cautious and also very alert about, you know, those, uh, uh, you know, rumors and uh, infodemic. Uh, we talk about infodemic. You know, sometimes, right. you know, falsehoods can actually create panic, which actually can, you know, at the end of the day, you know, create disastrous results. Yeah. Um, Professor Tosu, what do you think? How do you look at the, the stories, the vast amount of stories that we're seeing on the cases erupting in different parts of the world? Do you think they are doing a reasonably good job or do you think something more can be done? Well, the problem with mainstream media in the sort of capitalist world is that they want to, you know, make stories more arresting, more interesting, and that means often to exaggerate, to sensationalize. I mean, there have been stories about, uh, you know, so many fake stories, uh, stories about how to cure it, um, and, uh, you know, and then of course there is this whole social media where all kinds of narratives are being circulated. Um, I don't think the media systems are really geared up to dealing with an uh, emergency of this magnitude and I, I think in the coming weeks uh, managing uh, information in terms of sifting truth from half truths and, and downright lies is very important and there is a responsibility of uh, credible media organizations around the world and other uh, stakeholders whether they are governments or international mm. organization like WHO to ensure that there is a clearly thought through strategy about how you deal with the crisis. Uh, I mean, there have been stories, as you obviously know, but others too have been talking about it, about the fact that this is actually a you know, man-made crisis. Uh, the Daily Mail in, in London had a story about that, and Washington Times in, in, in the UK. Uh, now, these are not particularly serious newspapers, but they are popular papers. Daily Mail is one of the most widely right. read newspapers in the UK yeah. and has a huge following on, on, the, on its web, web edition. So I think there is a, a need to really talk more about how do you manage information. And I don't mean in in sense of censor, censoring it, but actually, you know, creating a system within which the, you know, the, the truths and half-truths and lies can be, you know, sifted. And yeah. uh, it's not easy because we are living in this age of digital connectivity and, you know, there's a virality in news as well. No? So, you know, it's, it's hard. But I think that discussion has not really taken place yet and it ought to because the virus is spreading and spreading to areas where um, the, the information systems also are not properly developed. Yeah. Well, in, indeed, uh, we all need to be much more sophisticated in uh, dissecting and consuming the information that comes our way. Many thanks to my two guests. We have to leave it there, Professor Daya Tutsu and uh, uh, Professor Chen Kong joining us from Shanghai. And with that, we come to the end of the special edition of uh, The Point with Li Lu Xin, which is called Headline Buster. As usual, I'll see you next Friday at the same time on Headline Buster.